are you? What are you doing here? What are you doing in my house? You know the worst part about being a writer? The writing. I spend my days working, driving, cooking, eating, and all the while I have that itch in the back of my head. You should be writing right now. You haven't put out a story in over a month. Your work isn't good. You think you have time to relax like this? I try. I really do. I sit in the office at work, or in the car, or in bed, and I think to myself, all right, David. It's time to work on that story, your next big project. And I just blank. I don't know if it's thanks to overworking, underworking, lack of interest in my current stories or what, but let me tell you, I have never been so disappointed in myself. It's not fear, no, that's what gets my words caught in my throat when I try to work on the podcast. The fear of failure, of embarrassing myself. It's not anxiety. That's what makes it hard to read. I see so many great authors out there and I ask myself, can you ever live up to this? Can you make it as an author with these people in the way? And that's when I had a spectacular idea. Tracking down the first of these authors wasn't an easy task, no. All I had to go off of was a username on a Reddit page. And despite the rumors, the average Reddit user is not particularly skilled at tracking down people on the internet. The first few times, I, well, I got lucky. A few of these talented authors, they link their personal information. Twitters, Facebook, Amazon pages where you can read about their published works, read their names. That was my first. A man by the name of Ronald Higgins. He wrote a few highbrow stories, landed himself a metric assload of likes, or upvotes, whatever they're called, and published a book through Amazon, Celtic Karaoke, a cute little tale about an ancient spirit that would wander the streets of Europe, singing an ancient melody in a long-forgotten language that forced all who heard to sing along until they died. It wasn't a bad read, I could see why they had gotten so much attention, and not me. My intentions were good. Honest to God, I just wanted to meet the man, get his autograph, that sort of thing. He'll be thrilled to see he has such dedicated fans, I thought. It wasn't until my third night of scoping out his lovely little townhouse that things started to change. Look, I wasn't a stalker, okay? I just wanted to think of a better way to approach him than knocking on his door and declaring myself his biggest fan. What's that, Mr. Higgins? How did I find out where you live? Well, I tracked you down like a fucking psycho through your account on Reddit, of course. Yeah, that wasn't going to play out well. I figured I could bump into him at a coffee shop and claim I recognized him or something like that. But as I watched him, saw his every moment through those thin glass eyelids, my own little portals into his world, I began to notice things. Things that upset me so very much. He wasn't some upstanding, mysterious lover of ancient history and folklore. He wasn't some rich, elegant man with a well-trimmed beard and glasses. He was... he was normal. So painfully normal that even then I could feel the slow realization creep up through my stomach and wrap its icy fingers around my heart, but I ignored it, desperate to believe it wasn't true. No, instead I denied it, made excuses made lies. He's a fraud, I decided. He was a fake, a story thief, or maybe he had a ghostwriter. You have to understand, a part of me, a loud, desperate part of me, truly believed I was doing the right thing. I saw a bad man, and I had to act. So I did. The thing about nice neighborhoods is people don't always lock their doors. They tell themselves, it'll never be me, 
when the thought of a break-in comes to mind. I live in a good neighborhood. I know all my neighbors. But they didn't know me. I walked in like I owned the place. I even pretended I was Ronald coming home from a long day of work. I kicked my shoes off, hung my coat on the rack by the door, walked into the living room and just looked around, trying to understand the man, understand what made him write the way he did, if he wrote at all. I sat on the couch, curling my toes in the soft shag carpet and squeezed the brown fabric of the couch. Imagining him picking it out at the store and talking to the salesman. It's perfect, I even said, trying to mimic his voice from the times I'd heard him say good morning to his neighbors. Who, who are you? Damn, that was good. I should do impressions on Comedy Central. What are you doing in my house? He shouted, and I whipped my head around, realizing I had been so lost in my thoughts that I hadn't heard him walk into the living room holding a baseball bat and dressed in a brown nightgown that matched the carpet, couch, and walls. This guy can't be a great author. He has a terrible sense of color. Have you ever been in a fight before? It's not like I expected. People talk about the adrenaline making their heart beat fast and their mind race, but I felt slow. It was like I was submerged in mud. Every movement happened after I wanted it to. I could barely focus. My mind was crawling, and I spent almost half the fight empty-headed. My mind and body were overwhelmed with everything I was feeling. The fear, the anxiety, and yes, there was a lot of adrenaline involved. Though, that only made things worse. I couldn't keep up with it all, and it made everything so clumsy and awkward that he could have hit me with that bat even if he were moving in slow motion. It smacked against my arm, raised just barely in time to stop the bat from cracking my skull open like an egg. My palm slammed into my face and I could already feel my eyes starting to swell. That fucking hurt. Luckily, or in hindsight, maybe unluckily, that was enough to yank me free from my mind mud. I've never been in a fight, but he had a bat and I didn't want to get hit with it, closer or farther away. I tackled him catching him mid-swing and knocking him to the floor as he started defending the bat like it was all he had in the world. He could keep it. I swung down on him with my fists like one of those orangutans on Animal Planet, mindless hammering filled with fear and anger, smashing my hands into his face until his upper jaw caved in and his teeth were either scattered on the floor or piercing his tongue and cheeks. I stood over him for a long time, looking at what I'd done. Now that's a book cover, I thought taking a picture with my phone, and then another, and another. Soon I had a dozen pictures of this mess of a man, looking like an extra from The Walking Dead, but something was missing. I wandered around the house, cradling my left hand and its broken finger as I tried to find that last thing he needed to be complete. I found it in the kitchen. Sitting on the table was a vase of flowers, and I picked up a single red rose walking back into the living room where I placed it in his mouth, right in the center, where a small pool of blood had already formed. Perfect, I thought, as I took a few more pictures. I decided I didn't really want to go to jail, so I found some bleach in the laundry room and poured it on just about everything I could think of. His body, the couch, the door handle, and the bat. I didn't know if it would work, but it was good enough for me. The drive home was long, and as I drove, I found myself thinking not about the horrible thing I had just done, or the possible consequences, no. I was thinking about my next story.